Agriculture, Rural Development, Policy and Finance Committee to order. Um, so today, uh, members, we're going to continue on the Board of Animal Health, uh, the history and the background of it. And um, we're going to start with the uh, Senate Council uh, memo uh, from uh, Laura Painter, and then we're going to move into uh, Dr. Beth Thompson, the director of the Board of Animal Health. So, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Anderson, do we have a quorum? Uh, Mr. Senator Anderson, we do. Uh, I'll ask Joel. Some are joined from hybrid, I understand as well. But uh, Joel, what's the what's the tally? Okay, five members uh, present. Six. Six, six members, uh, one of one on hybrid, uh, Senator Anderson. So, good Thank question. Uh, so, Senator uh, members, uh, let's start with uh, Senate Council. Uh, Ms. Painter, uh, if you want to go through the uh, memo that you put together with some of the uh, history, just to remind us uh, yes. the beginnings of the Board of Animal Health, uh, when it started, and um, how many of us were around before it started. And so, uh, members, and then we'll get into uh, uh, the explanation in greater detail uh, from with Dr. Thompson, the history, as well as other things the Board of Animal Health does. A uh, much deeper dive, but we'll be elbows deep in uh, in the Board of Animal Health today. So, uh, is that, uh, Ms. Painter, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, in 1903, the legislature established what the, what was called the State Livestock Sanitary well, Board. Ms. Painter? Yes. I, I think for the record, it'd be just good for you to identify yourself for the record as well. But uh, even though I called on you, but uh, understood. I think that's um, typical protocols best to understood. do. Thank you for that. I'm Laura Painter. I'm the legislative analyst for the Ag Committee. So in 1903, when the, when the board was first established, uh, there were five members three of whom were, quote, financially interested in the breeding and maintenance of livestock, and two of the members who were, quote, competent and qualified veterinary surgeons. Um, between 1913 and 1959, the law changed so that one of the three producers would be selected and recommended by the Livestock Breeders Association. And that changed again in 1959 when the producers were, um, quote, engaged in the production of livestock in the state. And then the law didn't change until 1980 when there was a requirement added for veterinarians to be licensed. And then in 1985, the reviser put out a bill to try to simplify the language in the statutes. And at that point, the language was changed to just say three of the, the members should be producers of livestock and two are practicing veterinarians licensed in Minnesota. And then last year, the legislature expanded the board to have an additional sixth member adding another livestock producer who was also a member of a federally recognized tribe located in Minnesota. Um, I'm happy to take any questions on that. Uh, questions, members, uh, Ms. Painter, um, just, just, just to tap into that 1985 revisers change, uh, can you recap that change again? You said uh, prior to 85, uh, they were all producers of livestock. And then after that, it's three three uh, producers. Uh, it had indicated and, and two veterinaries. Uh, just explain that a little bit more. Um, sure. So in 1980, the language was quote three shall be persons engaged in the production of livestock in the state. And then in 1985, the reviser wanted to simplify the language and statute without changing any of the meaning. And at that point, the language changed to say three of whom are producers of livestock in the state. Very good. And, and, and the memo references veterinarians were licensed in 1980. Before that, was it just a uh, education that, that people might have taken or uh, learned, learned from uh, other types of occupations, but there wasn't uh, an official veterinary license before 1980? Is that... Is that a I'm not sure. I'm not sure when the state reference? introduced a license for, for veterinarians, but that was when that requirement was introduced to the Board of Animal Health. Um, there were requirements for education and to be practicing prior to 1980. 
Oh, okay, so so maybe the nuances before 1980, it might not have had to be a licensed veterinarian if they had experience in veterinarian services. Is that is that correct? I would say yes. Um, Th that's your that's your reading that's as well. That's my that's my understanding. I don't. Sure. I haven't looked in detail as to when the state introduced licensure requirements for veterinarians. I, I can't really answer that question. Sure, that's that fine. I'm not. I was I'm introduced not... to to membership of the of the Board of Animal Health. Okay, Senator Dames has a question. Any other questions? Be after that, members, let us know. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Ma'am. Could you tell me uh, the current uh, makeup of the board? Uh, you say there's now what one egg producer? No, there's the, go ahead, the, the current. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, ma'am. Mr. Chair and, and Senator Deems, there are four livestock producers um, on the board currently. Or there's the legis the, the statute says there should be four members on the board who are livestock producers. And so when you say livestock producer, uh, are we talking of active production? The language itself isn't specific. And the, the language says three of whom are producers. And I'm so not sure three I, can, of them being, I can put any more detail on that. Three of them being producers, would that still be livestock or could that be grain or other egg commodities? I'm assuming it, it's, a, is the assumption it's livestock? Ms. Painters. Mr. Chair and Senator Dames, the language says three of whom are producers of livestock in the state. So presumably, yes, they would be livestock producers in the state of Minnesota. Thank you. And, and uh, any other questions, members? Senator Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Painter, you mentioned early on, uh, I thought in your testimony that you said four livestock producers and two licensed veterinarian, and then you came back to say to Senator Dames, three of them who are livestock producers. So I'm kind of confused when you said four livestock producers, and then you said three of them who are livestock producers. What, what happened to the other one of the four? Ms. Ms. Painter and uh, Senator Anderson, uh, her memo is, should be in your papers as well. If you wanna look at that as, as she's um, just describing it, it might make it clearer for all of us. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Painter. Yeah, Mr. Chair and, and Senator Anderson, you you are correct. I, I was reading from my memo um, from the 1985 language, but you're correct. In, in 2021, another livestock producer was added to that. So it now reads four. My apologies for that. Thanks so for Mr. Chair, clarification. Senator Anderson. So Mr. Chair, Ms. Painter. So instead of saying three of them who are livestock it's four of them must be livestock producers and two are licensed veterinarians correct Ms. painter mr chair and senator anderson and members that's correct um one of the four livestock producer members must be a member of a federally recognized tribe one must excuse me i didn't quite catch that go ahead and repeat Ms. painter one must be a member of a federally recognized tribe that was the change that was made last year, adding that fourth fourth livestock producer. And uh, Ms. Painter, I can add to that a little. Uh, Senator Anderson, if you recall, our final conference committee bill last year, uh, uh, there was a provision in the House that uh, had added a, a member to the Board of Animal Health um, as part of the final compromise. The uh, being actively engaged in livestock production was uh, but a member of the reservation was uh, was the final language agreed to. So it's consistent with the other three. So uh, uh, there was some concern about if CWD could affect uh, the reservation lands uh, and the being 
with CWD being part of the Board of Animal Health and just general livestock production, that was uh, at least part of the, the push from the house and the, the final language matches so, it up. So the fourth producer is the same as the three prior engaged in the uh, production of livestock in Minnesota. Uh, so they would presumably be engaged on the reservation. Okay, as a livestock producer. <laughs> as a livestock, active livestock producer. And then the other two would be veterinarians. Correct. Thank you. Correct. Any other questions, members? Ms. Painter, I think, did I recap that correctly? I believe so, yes. I wasn't here last year. <laughs> All right, members, uh, no further questions. Uh, nobody online? Okay. Very good. Uh, Ms. Painter, uh, thank you for that, that helpful uh, recap for us. Um, uh, members, we'll move to uh, Dr. Beth Thompson uh, with presentation on the history and uh, uh, the duties of the Board of Animal Health. And so uh, that's one of the beauties of the off non-budget session. Uh, we can maybe dig into some of these committees or, or uh, agencies under our jurisdiction that uh, sometimes get get all melded together in a budget bill. So, uh, Dr. Thompson, welcome back. Uh, identify yourself for the record, and um, I'll let you just proceed with with your presentation, which members is also uh, in your packet information um, uh, from from our staff. So, uh, Dr. Thompson, welcome welcome back. And then members, just maybe Dr. Thompson, if I can just pause quick, just to give everybody a bit of a roadmap. Uh, the uh, discussion with the uh, members of the Board of Animal Health that have been appointed. Uh, we had once talked about having them today with schedules that just worked out better that they will be up on Wednesday. And uh, we'll have that discussion uh, to, to uh, essentially conclude our, our overview and look looking at the issues around the Board of Animal Health and the duties that they take care of and a better understanding of this, uh, this agency that's uh, sometimes we don't hear a lot about or a lot from, but they're certainly quite critical in the agriculture infrastructure in our state. So welcome again, uh, Dr. Thompson. Uh, you may proceed. Identify yourself for the record. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Beth Thompson. I am the state veterinarian and executive director of the Board of Animal Health, and I am technologically challenged. <laughs> <laughs> Just so, so members realize, I'm seeing a full screen presentation on my computer right now, but you all aren't able to see that, so. Okay, we'll have help. Is that just not part of the veterinary license curriculum, <laughs> uh, Dr. Thompson? Is that, is that what the problem is? <laughs> It you you might have got my joke of uh, being elbow deep in, in Board of Animal Health today. Anybody that didn't grow up on a farm wouldn't know what I'm referring to. So, <laughs> and, I, and I appreciate that. And, and I'm glad that the others up here are having the same issues that I am. And go ahead, Dr. Thompson. And yeah. you might want to just get a little closer to the microphone. I think you'd come through a little stronger. And, and hopefully members, um, you, you're not gonna be distracted, but I'm gonna leave it up the way it is right now so we can run through it quickly uh, because I do have a second presentation that's gonna focus more on uh, some of our foreign animal disease concerns. But this, this is a short presentation on the overview of the Board of Animal Health. And I appreciate that history because I'm a, a little bit of a, a history nerd. And I would recommend if anybody uh, does wanna look into animal health in Minnesota, uh, this book, 100 Years of Progress, The History of Veterinary Medicine in Minnesota is just outstanding. It covers all animal health in the state of Minnesota. It's a little bit outdated, but it does have some good information. To some of the questions that were going on uh, or were, were being asked about the initial uh, Livestock Sanitary Board is what the uh, Board of Animal Health was called when it was first put in place back in 1901. And uh, reading from the book, um, the bill was introduced in the legislature to separate the veterinary department from the Board of Animal Health. Um, the, the sponsors of the bill weren't able to agree. And then in 1903, a revision of the original bill passed with the support of the Livestock Breeders Association, the Minnesota Veterinary Medical Association, the stockyard companies, and the Board of Health. 
uh, everyone, the Board of Animal Health actually started at the Board of Health. There were, there were diseases such as glanders and also tuberculosis that were plaguing the human population. And they figured out that uh, those diseases had a very close relationship with animals because folks were living above their barns and there were animals below. There were animals that were taken into town and drinking out of public troughs. And so there was, there was all sorts of uh, crossover between humans and animals. So the, the first chief of veterinary division of the University of Minnesota was included as a member on the Board of Animal Health. And something that hasn't changed, the state veterinarian and the executive director, the position that I'm in, serves at the pleasure of the board. And so I have to be uh, re-interviewed, reassessed every year uh, come June uh, at that board meeting. So the initial salaries, and I do have a, a misprint on this, the initial salaries for the state veterinarian were, was $2,400 a year. We had just a couple of field vets. That was um, the, the salary for the field vets was $2,100 per year. And the appropriation initially for the Board of Animal Health was $19,000 with uh, a separate $2,500 going to the University of Minnesota Veterinary Department. And through the years, we, we found, you know, of course, again, going back to, we actually came from the Department of Health. We found our good partners in the Department of Agriculture. We still lean on the Department of Health. Uh, other agencies such as uh, Department of Natural Resources and some of the other agencies involved with what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, either rurally or in the suburbs, is, is certainly uh, part of our partnerships. Uh, research at the University of Minnesota, individual or private researchers and, and other states, and then all the way up to the federal government. Um, as I mentioned on the slide, the Department of Health continues to be integral to, to what we do. I've got a picture of a I think deceased bat up on the, the slide there. So diagnostics for animal diseases were initially carried out at the Minnesota Department of Health. Uh, but now uh, with the veterinary diagnostic lab uh, in Minnesota, both located in St. Paul and the Min Minnesota poultry testing lab uh, out in Wilmer, um, we use that lab rather than the Minnesota Department of Health. And then lastly, uh, as was mentioned initially, uh, we do have a six member citizen board. Uh, four members are livestock producers in the state of Minnesota. One of those four is now to be a member of a federally recognized tribe. And then we also have two veterinarians licensed to practice here in the state of Minnesota. Um, I have a list of the work that we do at the board up on the screen there. Um, it, it includes everything from the state fair to horse sales, to individual um, disease programs, to sheep and goats, uh, small animal, um, agriculture, traceability, state and federal partnerships across the board. We have quite, uh, a, I'll call it a buffet of different programs that we have at the Board of Animal Health. And with that, Mr. Chair, members, I'll um, take any questions or if you want me to move right into the foreign animal disease uh, portion, I'd be happy to do that also. So, um, Dr. Thompson, um, strikes me that $19,000 uh, with your budget, uh, maybe we've been a little generous with you lately. <laughs> Mr. Chair, members, it's, it's well, appreciated. It's well, appreciated. what would... What would nineteen thousand dollars get you today? <laughs> Half a salary, maybe. So, Mr. Anyways. Chair, members, yeah, it would probably be about half a salary of of some of our office workers, especially. Yes. And that, that's amazing. That was the whole budget uh, back when it started. So, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dr. Thompson, did you serve with uh, Tom Haggerty when he was the uh, state veterinarian for the state of Minnesota. Um, Dr. Thompson. Mr. Chair, members, uh, I was not fortunate enough to be on the board at the same time that Dr. Haggerty was state veterinarian, 
but I did know him. Uh, he continued to work, of course, with Minnesota Veterinary Medical Association. Um, I saw him every year at the state fair. Um, yes, he was, uh, he was uh, you know, every, everybody knows Tom Haggerty. Yes, yes, yes. Well, he, from my house district, when I was in the Minnesota house, I would always see him and he was always at my office and made sure that we were taking care of the Board of Animal Health. So just wanted to ask, and sometimes people are, and some people haven't had a chance to meet him. I just want to ask a question about the board members. I see, Go ahead, according members. to this, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, there's a vacant livestock producer. Is that, is that according to this, a tribal member that's not been appointed yet, or has it uh, happened and we're, it's not on this sheet yet? And Dr. Thompson. Yes. Um, Mr. Chair, members, and thank you for that question, Senator. So the governor's office appoints our board members. It's my understanding that the position that is also required to be a producer and a member of a federally recognized tribe has not been appointed yet. And then we have a second position that opened up at the beginning of the year. Currently, Erica Sawatsky uh, serves in that position. Uh, she is able, due to the statutes, she's able to continue serving until somebody is appointed or I think two of our quarterly board meetings over and above when she would have been moved off the board, if that makes sense. Uh, so Dr. Thompson, is, is that the process? Uh, if they, they continue on for two quarters and then, then would drop off if there's not a reappointment or another appointee? Yeah, and um, Mr. Chair, Dr. members, Thompson. generally, yes. It, some, some of the appointments are later. They don't happen right at the beginning of the year. So it, it, it's a, a benefit for the board for those members to continue serving. So we have membership on the board until um, somebody is appointed into that position. Okay. And, and uh, not, while we're on that, do we know any status uh, update on uh, Ms. Swatsky's interest in continuing or reappoint being reappointed or if there's another appointee in the process but what's the status um if you know yeah um mr chair members it's my understanding that ms sawatsky did reapply and there are others that have also applied for the position but i don't have an update on where the governor's office is at this point okay other questions members otherwise go ahead uh dr thompson All right, one moment, uh, Mr. Chair, members. Yeah, and, and again, members, technologically challenged, but as long as I have backup on my challenges, I'm good. There, okay. Uh, members, this, this presentation is meant to give you an overview on the foreign animal disease uh, responses and planning that we're doing at the Board of Animal Health uh, in the past year. And so I'm gonna move right into uh, foreign animal disease, or actually I'm going to move past the overview and give you a foreign animal disease that uh, has been located in the United States for uh, a couple of years now, a couple, three years since 2019, rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus two has been in the United States. It was very interesting because there was, there was a case out on the East coast in New York, then there was a case on the West coast, and then it seemed to find its home really down in the Southwest. So Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, some of those States. And this is a disease uh, that is concerning because it, it affects both wild and domestic rabbits. Um, we had a case in South Dakota on the west side of the case uh, that was fairly clearly brought in by the owners of some domestic rabbits and it was a one and done. It didn't seem to get uh, established in the uh, wild population. 
Um, however, um, in Minnesota, we did have an infected premises and it was a, a veterinarian, surprisingly, uh, who had a couple of pet rabbits. Uh, the first rabbit died. Uh, she didn't notice too much going on with that. Within a day or two, the second rabbit died. Um, and that brought, and she brought it to our attention. Uh, we went through the protocols for foreign animal diseases. Uh, we did end up quarantining that home. Um, this happened back in the fall of 2021. The quarantine on the home was released in November of 2021. We worked closely with the Department of Natural Resources. Again, this is a, a virus that can affect both um, domestic and wild rabbits. And we can, we can think about what would happen if it got into our wild rabbits and, and the possible uh, detriment to the ecosystem. So the, um, the, the good part of this story is we met a lot of really, really involved rabbit owners, a, really a, a, a number of um, veterinarians who specialize in some of these companion animals. And I did it in the, in the house when I gave this presentation and I'm gonna tell all of you, if you have a chance, uh, go to the website for Peace Bunny Island. It's, uh, if, you, if you go to the state fair, and you see the rabbits that are located in the Miracle of Birth Center, they come from Peace Bunny Island. And this is a, truly an island out in the Mississippi and the owners of these uh, rabbits use their rabbits for comfort animals. They use them to take them into nursing homes. They use them uh, in a number of different places for education. And that group, Peace Bunny Island and a number of veterinarians stood up vaccine clinics for rabbit hemorrhagic disease and bunny owners, rabbit owners across the state of Minnesota. Uh, they just did a, an excellent job with, with um, making sure that uh, COVID protocols were in place. Uh, these were drive-through clinics and the rabbits had to come back for booster shots. Um, and, and they did such a good job that the Board of Animal Health we started getting phone calls from Wisconsin rabbit owners wanting to know if they could bring their rabbits into Minnesota because we had approved the vaccine, we had vaccine clinics put in place and it was done at a very, you know, very rapidly for, for all rabbit owners. So um, one, one thing about one positive, I guess I'd say, when you're handling foreign animal diseases, there are always things that you learn about. And this was, this was one of those uh, responses that we really widened our um, perspective on what it is to handle a foreign animal disease. And I think we also did a lot of good outreach. Uh, going forward, we're gonna be working again with Peace Bunny Island and some of the veterinarians involved on what's going to be required this next summer when we come up for fairs and exhibitions because those rabbits are gonna be back out at those county fairs and they're gonna be back at the state fair when we wanna make sure that they're vaccinated and protected against this, this disease. Um, Dr. Thompson, Senator Dames has a question. Senator Dames. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Dr. Thompson. Could you give us a little better idea what this disease is or what its symptoms are or what, a little more in the process, a little more about uh, Dr. Thompson. Yes, Mr. Chair, Senator Dames, uh, members of the committee. Uh, really, it is as it's named. It's a hemorrhagic disease. So generally speaking, what happens is a, a rabbit owner will see uh, maybe a little bit of lethargy. The, the rabbits aren't moving around as much, but truly they die quickly. And sometimes the only, the only sign that you see is a little bit of, of blood coming out of the nose. It, it's, it moves quickly and it, it's quite, quite devastating for both you know, domestic and wild rabbits. Senator Dames, follow up. Dr. Thompson, on that uh, uh, last summer, I guess it was, I was talking to some constituents and they've gotten more and more into the meat rabbits. Um, I imagine that would be, whether it's a home pet rabbit or meat rabbits is kind of what they were farming. Um, is that the kind of domesticated rabbits you're talking about uh, um, with this disease or, or where, where did you guys find or, or it sounded like they were domesticated rabbits and you're wor worried to keep it from the wild. Is that, is that correct? And were, were they engaged in meat production or what, what kind of domestication? Yeah, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, the, the case that we had in Minnesota, they were actually pet rabbits. 
So two rabbits that lived in the home, it was a, a home that belonged to a veterinarian, but two pet rabbits. Um, in the Southwest and in, in some of the other states, it's already established itself in the wild. And so they're seeing die-offs in the wild, but it can affect both domestic rabbits, you know, such as the, the pets, the, the meat rabbits, but also wild rabbits too. So uh, Dr. Thompson and then Senator Anderson has a question. To, uh, so is it just a new, new, new type disease that rears its head from time to time, works its way through nature, if you will, and do all rabbits get it? Or is there worry about extinction of the rabbits and, or, or, or some immune, any, any, any thoughts or what, what would we be seeing, looking at uh, from, from a epidemiology perspective? Yeah, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, the, the virus itself or the, the disease itself wasn't found in the U United States until 2019. So it's new to the United States or fairly new to the United States in, in the past, um, not to my knowledge that had been diagnosed either in wild or domestic rabbits. It, it's, it's an interesting, you know, it, was it brought in with some feed? Was it brought in with maybe some international imports of rabbits? We're, we're not sure. Very good. Senator Anderson has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Thompson, uh, Senator, uh, Doctor, sorry. Um, sounds like you got rid of two tame rabbits because they have this disease. Uh, do you know how many animal units the state has as far as animals? Uh, the reason I ask is just my sister has over 40 meat uh, type tame rabbits and just wondering how many uh, if there's been a calculation made on that. Senator, or uh, Dr. Thompson. Yeah, M Mr. Chair, Senator Anderson, committee members, I do not know, we do not track the number of either domestic or meat uh, rabbits that are here in, in the state of Minnesota. Uh, that is not one of the, the species that we, we track closely. Um, I'm thinking that there might be some avenue for uh, looking that, at that in the future, especially if we start looking at identification and some sort of vaccine protocols for exhibitions. But as far as pet rabbits, that would be more difficult. And, and the two rabbits, um, again, one had died, and then a few days later, the second one died. And that's what spurred the veterinarian to, to call the Board of Animal Health and, and let us know. Mr. Chair, Senator Anderson, uh, Dr. Thompson, was this last year that this took place in, in the fall? So we don't really know how, if there's been an ongoing investigation of rabbits across the state or in the, in the area, or maybe you do have that uh, knowledge. Dr. Thompson? Yeah, Mr. Chair, Senator Anderson, that's a good question. We did do, we blanketed as much as we could uh, vet clinics, veterinarians, and reached out as, as broadly as possible when this happened, because it's, it's concerning when you have a foreign animal disease, um, and there was no good epi on how it actually got to Ramsey County in, in Minnesota. So, so we reached out as far and wide as we could. We had a lot of information up on our website. Uh, we, we built biosecurity for rabbits, you know, what, what folks need to be thinking about. Um, there's even a, I, I'll call it a bed and breakfast boarding facility in, uh, it's, it's the Twin Cities area just for rabbits. So the, there, there's a lot of rabbits out there and how to actually get our arms around where they're at. I think it's, it's we're gonna be dealing directly with veterinarians uh, for those folks that, that have oversight on their health. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very good. Uh, you may proceed, uh, Dr. Thompson. All right. Um, and, and thank you for those, those good questions. Uh, second foreign animal disease that's that high on our list right now for um, both um, here in Minnesota, and I think I'd, I'd say you know, across the United States because of the hog production that we have is African swine fever. Um, this is, we've, we've been watching African swine fever for a number of years now. And if you look on, on the screen, you can see we had uh, cases in Poland, Germany, Italy, and Macedonia. Um, those cases in Poland go back a number of years. And, and the one thing to remember when we talk about Europe is that there's a lot of wild boar. 
And um, as with a lot of wild animals, they don't respect um, those geopolitical lines that we put up either between counties or between countries. Uh, but uh, both wild and domestic swine in Poland were affected back in 2014. And then a commercial operation just a few years ago in, in 20. Uh, same is happening in Germany. They're tracking both wild boar and also those domestic and, and commercial operations. Italy was just, uh, just this last month or about a month ago uh, in January in wild boar. And then Macedonia also just re very recently. Uh, what, what is concerning for the Board of Animal Health and everybody in the U.S. was the finding in the Caribbean, uh, specifically the Dominican Republic uh, last summer, uh, late July 21. Um, as you all know, the Dominican shares an island with uh, Haiti. And as you all are probably know to the um, political climate, both in the Dominican, but especially Haiti um, is, is not good. Uh, they, they have a lot of concerns with uh, economics. Um, there's a lot of concerns with how people are fed. Uh, protein is very important to those folks in those islands. And uh, this is concerning because, you know, not, it's not far from the U.S. coast. And the last time we had uh, African spine fever in this hemisphere was back in the 80s, and it was in the Caribbean. Now, we have not seen it on the continental U.S., ever. And if, if we were to find African swine fever on the continental US, or for that matter, those territories that are very close to the Dominican and to Haiti, uh, it, the trade impact of that would be long lasting and very hard. Uh, the US does export approximately 25 to 30% of hogs and products. So that, that part of hog production for the US would be gone. And in, in addition to that, let's, let's remember that Minnesota is number two in hog production in the US. So uh, USDA has been down in the Dominican Republic for a period of time now. Uh, I was on a phone call, uh, Dr. Jeff Kaisen, who's a state veterinarian down in Iowa, was also in the Dominican for a couple, three weeks um, and reported back to a number of us uh, state veterinarians this morning. Uh, the, it, it, it's interesting because uh, the government in the Dominican Republic, while they're open to USDA and you know Dr. Kaizen being a state animal health official, um, being down there and taking advice, really no further steps have been made in the last couple of months in the Dominican as far as you know either you're taking a strong stance and eradicating hog herds or for that matter, putting in a really good, robust permitting system. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., there are folks out on the roads that are watching what's moving to slaughter and whether or not pigs are, are moving around. But after 6 p.m., uh, those, those folks go home and uh, hogs are still moving. In addition to that, you know, just with the political unrest in Haiti, um, we, being the United States, USDA and state animal health officials really haven't wrapped our arms, arms around what's going on in Haiti. So here in Minnesota, um, one note, and I've got a, a picture up on the screen there for you, our Minneapolis St. Paul airport, um, all the food waste from MSP is incinerated. And please remember that African swine fever can stay, the virus can stay alive in processed products for quite a period of time. It's, it's a really hardy virus. So um, all the food waste from those international flights at MSP are incinerated. We've got uh, detection dogs that are out at the airport. And uh, it's my understanding that uh, actually Minneapolis St. Paul Airport leads the nation or is one of the leaders in the nation for uh, detections. So those, those canine uh, helpers are doing a really good job for us. So, Dr. Thompson, um incinerated but the virus still or disease still still can exist after incineration mr chair members uh just to be clear the food is incinerated from the the flights that are coming in internationally and then um that will kill the virus that that does kill the virus okay. However, in, in normal situations, when, when folks don't have incineration, and this is one of the problems that the Dominican Republic has, is, is they 
feed a lot of their food waste to their hogs. And so the, the food waste coming out of kitchens, coming out of um, folks that have grocery stores, uh, yeah. they continue to feed uh, the food without instant or without cooking it properly back to the hogs. And then the hogs become reinfected or become infected because the virus isn't killed. So Dr. Thompson, do we know the African ASF comes from from food originally, or what? We're, we're, what causes? Or uh, imagine it's a strain like coronavirus is a strain, and it, and it just keeps mutating to some degree. Is that what happens? Yeah, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I I know there are a couple of different strains of African swine fever. Generally, it um, it spread uh, via blood. Uh, of in infected hogs, there's a high virus load in blood, but when you have um, uncooked pork products or undercooked pork products that are then fed back to hogs, uh, that, that's one way it can be spread. But generally speaking, um, we're talking about nose to nose contact or if in the case of wild boar, maybe um, getting a hold of those uncooked products or undercooked products. And, and so, Dr. Thompson, the incineration that goes on here in Minnesota, is that uh, a direct handling uh, result of, of trying to minimize or eliminate the chance of ASF coming into Minnesota or the U.S., hopefully, from incinerating those food products because that, that plane travel here, the only thing that could bring it is, is the food that might somehow find its way into the garbage that might otherwise find its way into feed for, for, for pigs. Is that, is that the theory or am I not, not following that right? Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, members, um, I can't answer that specifically. I, I know that uh, airports do incinerate their waste so that there isn't a, a possibility of whether it's African swine fever or other pathogens, human pathogens, animal pathogens, plant pathogens, uh, it's always best to incinerate that waste if it's coming in internationally. But I can't, I can't speak to what, what factor um, made our, our, our airport use incineration. I think it's been in place for a number of years. All right, thank you. And then uh, just to touch briefly on what Minnesota is doing for African swine fever preparedness. Um, as, as I mentioned in my previous presentation, we have a number of partners, state agency partners, and we also look to our veterinarians, our producers. Um, we, we've got some top-notch researchers, both on the, the public side and also on the private side in the state of Minnesota. But we, uh, we realize that we're also just one state. And so the, the Midwestern states, uh, the states that have high hog populations, we all work together. Uh, here in Minnesota, we have an emergency disease management committee for swine. We have a number of subcommittees. And again, uh, those subcommittees are made up of people across the state working in those different areas. We also have an African swine fever response plan, uh, as do most states when they're responding to a foreign animal disease. Um, we have surveillance ongoing through cooperative agreements with uh, USDA, United States Department of Agriculture. And we've also trained up um, or are working on, are working on training up certified swine samplers, which is a newer program, again, not just here in Minnesota, but other states as well. So African swine fever, again, it's in our hemisphere. Uh, it's very close to both Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands down in the Caribbean. And there would be a, a devastating impact if this disease were to make it onto the mainland or into our territories uh, down in the Caribbean. The next disease, um, I'm gonna start out, first of all, talking just a bit about low path avian influenza and then move into highly pathogenic avian influenza. So we did have uh, H6N1 in the state um, from October of 20 through June of 21. This was low pathogenic avian influenza. Low pathogenic means that the birds aren't dying. And in addition to that, 
um, more than likely it's not going to convert itself into a highly pathogenic form. So on the right hand side of the screen, uh, you all, this was fairly recent in November of 21, we did have an H5 uh, that was found during routine surveillance in a turkey flock, ended up we had a second turkey flock too uh, that was diagnosed with this H5 um, out in the um, west central part of the state. Again, these are low pathogenic avian influenza. Uh, once the birds clear the virus in Minnesota, generally, we try to get them into slaughter channels. So in other words, we're not going in and depopulating these birds. We're making sure that they're clear of the virus, and then they can move into slaughter channels uh, and, and are a protein source. What has been going on more recently and, and is very concerning uh, is highly pathogenic avian influenza. And if you think back to 2014, 2015, this is the virus that came into Minnesota uh, and wiped out a lot of our turkey farms, uh, especially in the Western part of the state. So on the screen right now, I've got a map of high path avian influenza uh, globally. And this actually, this needs to be updated after the announcements today. But if you focus on the, um, what, what's going, so, some, I think it was Dr. Lauer, our um, avian our poultry assistant director out in Wilmer said, Europe's been on fire. If you take a look at all of the, the wild detections of high path and also the domestic detections of high path, in Europe going on just from January of 21 through January of 22. It's hard to see if the, there's, there's any free space in those or on that map. And uh, think about where those detections are taking place when I move into the next map of the world. Uh, all wild bird birds um, move in pathways. It doesn't mean that they stay in the same pathway at all points in time, but for the most part, uh, the, the migratory waterfowl that we see here in Minnesota at some point, we're probably down in South America and also move up into Canada. If you look at the pathway that crosses the Atlantic, the East Atlantic flyway, that takes in most of that European um, play, uh, the, the domestic and wild waterfowl um, detections in Europe, and then it overlaps not only with the eastern seaboard, but I would argue it also overlaps in the Mississippi Flyway. This is truly concerning when you have a disease that's in some other part of the, of the world, uh, because very quickly that disease with, with birds migrating can um, end up in a different, in a different flyway. So, Dr. Thompson, uh, high path influenza, avian influenza is seems to be the concerning. Uh, what's the difference between high path and low path uh, avian influenza? And if I understood you right, the low path is maybe more common but less concerning. You'd still uh, market and, and process the animals as a protein source, is that, is that correct? And then I guess last wrapped into the question is, it can be any migratory bird that brings the disease out, but it's uh, what are turkeys that seem to be the most susceptible to it? Or is it is it other wild birds as well as other poultry or, or products? So kind of a few things wrapped into that if you could. Yeah, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. So back to low path avian influenza generally is starts with an H that isn't a five, is not a five or a seven. You can have low path H5, H7, but generally it's an H6. Uh, there can be some other numbers that are involved. The H5s and H7s can either be low path or high pathogenic avian influenza. Um, depending on, and really what I look at is, is whether or not the birds are getting clinically sick and or dying. That can change a, a low pathogenic into a high pathogenic avian influenza. What is concerning about what's going on in Europe right now and what we're seeing now in the United States is highly pathogenic avian influenza 
This is the same strain or similar strain to what we saw in 2015. It's the Guangdong strain that has made its way back into the Americas um, from six or seven years ago. So the um, low path avian influenza, of course, we don't market birds that have disease. And we do serology on these birds so that we understand when they have the virus and when they don't. And so with low path avian influenza, as they continue to surveil the birds and find that the virus has passed, they can then be marketed. Because remember, low path, they're not getting sick. They can, they, at, once they clear the virus, they can be marketed and go into, into slaughter channels. Contrast that with high pathogenic avian influenza, the birds are dying. And, and I hope you all remember what happened in 2015. Within 24 to 48 hours, if, if a uh, barn of turkeys had high path avian influenza, they were quickly dying. Um, one thing that's very important, and this is, this is more on the epi side of, of the virus, but one thing that is important to know about the Guangdong um, strain that we're seeing right now is it seems that it's very uh, adapted to poultry. Even though it's coming from the wild waterfowl, both low path and high path comes from wild waterfowl and other um, wild birds. But this, this Guangdong strain seems to be highly adapted to poultry, which is very, very concerning. So if we go to December- Dr. Thompson, where's that, where's that, where's that, Wong, you said Guangdong? Uh, Guangdong, Mr. Chair. Where's that, where's that out of, what country is that? Or where did that get its name from? And then yeah. Senator Anderson has a question. Um, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, it's in China. I'd have to look up exactly where it's at in China, but it is, it is from China. It's a very interesting area. My understanding is there's a lot of um, domestic goose production in that area. And at the same time, there's a lot of interaction with uh, wild waterfowl. So uh, surprisingly or not surprisingly, there's, the virus has come out of that area. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Thompson, uh, the previous slide you showed, uh, in the, it said, uh, it showed a, a, a red dot and it looked like maybe North Carolina and then a green dot up in where Newfoundland or Labrador or wherever it is. And I'm wondering if the differentiation between, because the key says showing 500 out of 3,198 events. Is there a differentiation there between red and green? As far as the, uh, they must both show 500 events, but is there, oh, I see one, one is con considered domestic and one's considered wild. Um, so the, the wild uh, animals that were found in, I guess in North Carolina on that stage. What is that? How, how's that? How who does that? Who makes that dif differentiation as far as coming up with those figures and finding out what uh, that virus is? Uh, how is it influencing? Dr. Dr. Thompson. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Anderson, members of the committee, I I think. To answer your question, and I'll get into some more details about what's been found here in the U.S. in the wild and what's also been found in domestic okay. commercial uh, in just a few slides, but if your question is about the 500 of 3,100, 3,200 events, this was pulled from a national database, so some of this information is just a snapshot of maybe a bigger database and the information that's held there as far as avian influenza. Okay, I look forward to more information. All right, we'll let you continue. Thanks, Dr. Thompson. So moving on into a, the more of the present uh, time in December, December 20th, um, our, our partners up in Canada, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency announced a detection of highly pathogenic avian influenza uh, over on the eastern, east, far, far eastern side of, of Canada. Uh, my understanding is the flocks that where this was first detected was um, a multi-species. They had a number of different species in the flock. There were some outside, there were some inside, and they were considered an exhibition flock. So these folks would take these birds out and show them in different, different areas. 
Um, and this was very concerning, but it, if you think back to those pathways, those flyways, uh, it makes sense that if uh, a wild waterfowl were to fly over with the virus, this would be the first place that it would actually hit um, here in, in North America. Then if you move further on, um, a few weeks later, we found, uh, we being United States um, Veterinary Services and Wildlife Services confirmed a case of avian influenza in South Carolina. And this was in the American Widgeon and also in a Northern Shoveler. Now, again, these are wild waterfowl. Uh, we had not yet at that point found any cases in um, domestic poultry. If you then move on to this month and just this last week in February, uh, February 8th to be specific, there was a detection of this same virus um, in Indiana. And Indiana in this Du Bois County, uh, they have also experienced high path avian influenza back in 2016. Uh, that was a different high path. Uh, this is a very uh, turkey heavy area in Indiana. And uh, state animal health officials there um, immediately responded. Uh, this was a four barn turkey site. Uh, there was one barn that was positive. The other three barns remained negative, but state animal health officials went in and depopulated the whole site. And then in addition to that, they did surveillance in 10 kilometers around that site and did not find any more virus. So this is, this is a very telling situation. Um, sometimes, again, going back to the difference between low pathogenic and high pathogenic avian influenza, uh, low path can convert itself to a high pathogenic avian influenza. That's not what happened here. This, again, was the Guangdong strain. Um, and it was the same strain that's been found on the East Coast. And it's the same or similar strain to what we saw in 2015. So, and Dr. Thompson, um, I'm just going to ask a question because it's going through my mind. Uh, another, another you know, animal virus in this case, but a virus originating in China. Uh, is, is there any chance it's it's more than natural? Is it is it can you manipulate these viruses and release them potentially or not? Do we have any concern of that? Well, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I guess I've never, I've never thought about, you're talking if whether or not this could have been um, uh, like a human manipulated versus a domestic and, and wild waterfowl. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do, do we ever ask those questions, I guess, because uh, this, this virus could, and as we saw in 2014, 2015, it raised significant havoc in the poultry economy. Um, it just, just asking the question, I guess, uh, yeah. or, or do we ask those questions? Because if it, if, if it could be, I mean, it might change or manipulate how, how we would respond, but uh, just, just, just seems, seems strange that they're both coming out of the same country, but maybe that's just, just normal and natural. Yeah, and, and Mr. Chair, members of the committee, if you remember back in 2014, we started seeing detections of this virus down the West Coast. Uh, and again, it started out in wild waterfowl. I believe that there was one case in a commercial facility in California, and then it jumped over to the, the Mississippi Flyway where we are. Um, it, it's, it's an interesting um, thought that the, there might be some human interaction that's, that's causing some of, some of the, the virus to be transported. But I think the, the fact that we find it in the, the wild waterfowl, and then we also find it then in commercial or domestic waterfowl, um, I would point the finger at the uh, wild waterfowl for, for tracking it across the U.S. and across, uh, across the world. And I guess Dr. Thompson is, is one of the, I'm remembering that Senator Dames, I think, uh, was pretty active in the bill that we passed uh, uh, the, some emergency funding at the time. But one of the things I, I recall was warmer weather was our friend. Uh, the, the virus didn't do well once we got into 
warmer spring weather and summer summer weather or am I recalling incorrectly? Yeah. Is, is that a is that a thing we 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 look to get to a certain point where it's less contagious? Yeah, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, I don't know how many of you uh, hunt waterfowl, but yeah, okay. So viruses generally don't like hot and dry. So as you move into warmer weather, when you move into drier weather, it does tend to bring down uh, the the amount of virus in the environment. And then you think about when are our wild waterfowl moving? Um, most folks would be surprised that they're already moving. Uh, longer day length right now means that birds are starting to move out of those southern climates and move up towards the, the northern climates. And then, um, I, as I used to point out in 2015, we are the land of 10,000 lakes. So we have a, a lot of waterfowl that move through this area and stop by uh, in those lakes and ponds and swamps that we have across Minnesota. So we are a perfect place for this virus to be showing up um, sometime this spring. Go ahead, thanks. And then uh, members, just I think I've got just a few slides here because I wanted to update you. Um, as of this morning, we've had, the US has had a couple more detections of high path avian influenza um, as of today, both in Virginia and in Kentucky. So the Virginia, if, if you remember the Indiana case was commercial turkeys in Virginia, we've got uh, back, backyard mixed species. And then in Kentucky, uh, commercial broiler chickens. And these were just confirmed uh, 11 o'clock, I think it was this morning by USDA. So um, to go back, to take a step back and talk about the wild bird surveillance detections, um, I made a list and, and the map is up here too. Uh, both of the Carolinas, Virginia, Florida, Maryland, Delaware, and New Hampshire, um, all have had detections in wild waterfowl uh, in the past month to two months um, of this same virus of high path avian influenza. So it's very, very clear, excuse me, very clearly established in that Atlantic flyway. Uh, and because of, of the um, finding in Indiana, I would argue that it's also moved over into adjacent flyways. What we're doing at the Board of Animal Health right now, uh, we do have an emergency disease management committee for poultry also, and have had ongoing meetings with um, veterinarians, farmers, and others across the state. I mean, it's very important that we're all paying attention to biosecurity, whether you have a few egg layers in the backyard or whether or not you have commercial flocks. And so uh, thinking about where is your buffer area what uh, folks are you letting onto your farm and maybe in with your, your poultry, whether it's chickens or others, and then whether or not you're sharing uh, equipment with your neighbors. And it's very important that you start drilling down on biosecurity uh, because we don't wanna be tracking uh, that virus into our poultry flocks. We've also put out, especially for the smaller flock owners, uh, information on how to keep those flocks um, healthy. And uh, you know, one of, one of the things when we start moving, I've, I've mentioned it a couple of times today, moving into fair season, that becomes very important because uh, the, the poultry going to fairs, uh, people trading and, and mixing equipment when you're at the fair, all of that is the possible way that uh, viruses can be spread, especially high path avian influenza. And with that, uh, Mr. Chair, members, uh, that's the update I wanted to give you today. Uh, please, please, if you don't have um, our website bookmarked on, on your computer, we do have updates as they come out. And now that we're, we're seeing high path avian influenza in the US, we'll, we'll continue to update that as we get information. So Dr. Thompson, with the high path being on the East Coast, uh, as close as I think you said Indiana now. Um, is, is that considered uh, widespread in those states? Are they taking uh, extreme measures like we saw here in 2014, uh, 2015 with depopulation going on? Um, 
first part of the question. And then second, are we, as a, as a state, as Board of Animal Health, have you, is there other actions you've taken now restrict, is there any restriction of travel from of, of birds from those states to Minnesota or do they, how do they track them if they are coming back and forth? Um, what, what level of concern do we have on, let's say a scale of one to five, uh, what, are, are we in any sort of uh, mid-level alarm or is this pretty, pretty standard and it's not that rampant in any of those states? If you can give us just a little more detail of that and what we should be anticipating to hear about or, or not. Yeah, Mr. Chair, members of the, the committee, thank you for that question. So generally speaking, um, the, the poultry that we raise in Minnesota doesn't come from Kentucky, it doesn't come from Indiana, it doesn't come from those affected uh, states on the East Coast. Um, secondly, I can tell you that the state animal health officials in those states, uh, just like we did in 2015, at, once the disease is detected, very quickly stand up a response. And um, anything that's located within 10 kilometers of those infected sites uh, would be under quarantine. So they have to be permitted out of those control areas. And, and we haven't gotten any requests for, for any poultry uh, to be moved into the state from those control areas. In addition to that, my third point I'll make very quickly, uh, state animal health officials, we keep in contact with each other. So this afternoon, uh, there was a, a state animal health official call uh, and we're, we're open and honest because the shoe could very quickly be on the other foot. So we share information as we can so that we know what's going on in other states. And with that trust, um, I, I think we serve agriculture well because we understand and know uh, what other states are doing, what they're dealing with. And certainly if a disease lands in another state, we know about that as soon as possible also. Very good, thanks. Members, any other questions on that? Mr. Chairman? Uh, yeah, Senator Anderson, just one second. Uh, okay. And Dr. Thompson, you have the 2022 legislative priorities. Is that also something you intended to review with us or was that just for the committee's uh, purpose at this point in time? Uh, Mr. Chair, if, if you're speaking about the, I think it was like a two page PDF, that was just uh, something that our agency put together to help members and others uh, with our agency uh, goals for 2022 and looking back at, at some of the work we've done. Okay, and would you wanna walk through that briefly uh, when Senator Anderson's done with his question or were, were you not planning to do that? Uh, Mr. Chair, I wasn't planning on doing it, but if there are questions, I can certainly, I can certainly okay. take those. Senator Anderson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, think the, I think my question is a little bit out of the scope of, of animals, but uh, cause I know I have people who raise bees and they have found that they haven't been able to They've been finding that their nests, not nests, but their hives and stuff have been dying because of an insect that has gotten in. And I'm wondering, does the Board of Animal Health oversee that also? Dr. Thompson. Mr. Chair and Senator Anderson, we do not have an apiary on, on uh, our staff, I think, and I'm gonna turn around and look at Ms. Medina. I'm wondering if the Department of Ag uh, has some expertise in that area. Uh, if not, I know veterinarians who deal in bees too, uh, especially from other states. So if you want to get a hold of me, I can I can possibly get get you in touch with some folks. Thank Senator, you, Senator Anderson. Okay. Members, other questions? So, uh, Dr. Thompson, uh, we've got just a bit of time left, but. Um, so it's, so it's interesting, we look at the high path avian influenza. Uh, how, do, how does the DNR and the Board of Animal Health work together on uh, this scenario where it's a wild game, typically it sounds like uh, bringing the disease into the livestock uh, poultry industry. Um, how, how do you two work together on those types of interactions um, in light of kind of a similar but a different animal last week we had discussions on the chronic waste and disease uh, 
is, is there much interaction there that needs to be done or what does the DNR do to keep the avian flu uh, disease out of our state um, in, in, their, in their management practices as well? Yeah, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, in 2014 and 15, and I believe what's going to happen this year too, or at least my understanding, uh, USDA Wildlife Services will push out uh, surveillance plans for wild waterfowl to the different states. Up until about a week ago, uh, Wildlife Services was really focused on the two coasts versus coming into the middle of the country and looking at the Central Flyway and the Mississippi Flyway. So our Department of Natural Resources will be utilizing some of the funding, I think, coming from Wildlife Services and some of the direction that comes from Wildlife Services to go out and do sampling in wild waterfowl. So that, that is one way that uh, Department of Natural Resources and the board works together uh, when we have one of these diseases. I'm not sure, but I think we also may have uh, natural resources folks that might be in our incident management committee or in incident management team, uh, but I would have to double check on that. So uh, Dr. Thompson, it sounds like there's some interaction uh, between the two entities, agencies uh, on those diseases as, as needed as well? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, yes, there, there, there are interactions. Okay. And, 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 and I guess jumping back to what you talked about the rabbits earlier, is that, is that a similar interaction going on uh, with, with the DNR? You, you said it's maybe a new, relatively new disease, but something they're concerned about in the wild and whether there's anything they can do about it, I don't know, but talk about that just a bit. Yeah, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, as soon as we found uh, the disease in the domestic rabbits here in Minnesota, we did get a point person at the Department of Natural Resources. And then following that initial detection, uh, we did get a number of false alarms, I'll call them, from folks calling in uh, with pets or domestic rabbits that were um, dying unexpectedly. And we did that reporting also with the Department of Natural Resources. So we kept them in the loop as we found uh, additional, or we didn't find additional cases, but had, as we had additional phone calls on the disease. Very good. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Thompson. Um, members, any final questions? Otherwise, I think we've covered the topic pretty, pretty deep. All right, thank you, members. With that, uh, thank you, Dr. Thompson, for uh, the uh, good overview and the history of the Board of Animal Health. And uh, thank you for your uh, direction and leadership at the board. And uh, we look forward to continuing to work with you and uh, stay on top of things for agriculture here in Minnesota. So uh, with that, I think we might uh, we'll adjourn members, but Wednesday we'll uh, follow up with uh, some of the board members that we'll uh, introduce to the committee and, uh, and, and continue with Board of Animal Health to get to know your agency uh, better and better. So thank you, Dr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, uh, no further questions. So this meeting is adjourned.